there's something in the air and we don't know what it is or how much of it there is, but we do know that it makes people sick sometimes. I'm talking about bioaerosols. A bioaerosol is just a tiny floating thing of biological origin. You're making bioaerosols right now, like in the air that you breathe, there will be tiny droplets of water that contain fragments of bacteria or dead lung cells. Your skin is producing bioaerosols all the time. If you shuffle across your carpet, you'll kick up plumes of bioaerosol. One gross consequence of the human production of bioaerosol is that we get inside each other. Like next time you're in an interview scenario, just be aware that you're breathing the interviewer in and the interviewer is breathing you in. And when you leave the interview, you'll take some of the interviewer with you and you will leave some of yourself inside the interviewer. By the way, that is not a good answer to the question, what is your greatest weakness? If anything, it's a good example of how you integrate well with a team. I apologize for putting that image in your head, but it's probably best just not to think about it because unless the person you're exchanging bioaerosols with has an airborne infection, you'll probably be fine. In fact, bioaerosols have been around in the environment through the entirety of human evolutionary history. For example, it's how mold works. Mold works by being everywhere all the time. Every breath that you take contains mold spores. So it makes sense that we've evolved the ability to deal with that sort of thing. But the modern industrial environment that your lungs find themselves in contains a lot more bioaerosols than in our evolutionary history. So the question is, is there now too much of this stuff? Well, the first thing we need to do is characterize it. We don't really know what it is. Here's Ian Colbeck, professor of environmental science at Essex University. Not much is known about biological particles in the environment. So we are trying to come up with ways to measure biological particles or bioaerosols as, as we call them. The old microbiology approach would be to take a sample from the air using a filter. And then we would uh, grow the microorganisms and, and count them and identify. So we have to take the sample back to the lab and we have to do lots of complicated tests. And that, that takes days. That was Sean Tyrrell, Professor of Bioaerosol Science at Cranfield University. It's not just that this process is slow, it's also limited in terms of what it can show you. Anything that's already dead isn't going to grow in your Petri dish. It's quite laborious even to produce quite small data sets that are just snapshots in time. Can we come up with a sensor that could detect bioaerosol in real time? The answer is yes, but it's expensive. Like the machine that Sean's been using to investigate this is amazing. It draws air into itself and it draws the air through a little tube and crossing that tube is a laser beam. So if a particle crosses the laser beam, then it's going to temporarily reduce the brightness of the laser beam. That can be detected and it's like a switch that turns on something further down. It turns on an ultraviolet flash. So this particle carries on, gets flashed with ultraviolet light. We know that a lot of biological matter fluoresces. It, it, yeah. it just does it automatically. You know, you, you don't have to stain it or anything right. like that. Fluorescence is just when you shine ultraviolet light on something, that thing absorbs the ultraviolet light, but it then emits something else. It emits other wavelengths of light in a characteristic way. So you can take that emission spectrum and compare it to a database of known things. You can say, oh, that was pollen that came through. And in fact, it was this specific pollen. There can be hundreds of these particles going through every second. Um, so th this is a device that can measure a lot, a lot of particulates. If you wanted to get really forensic and analyze the DNA that's floating around you to sequence the genes that are in the air, you might start with a machine called a Coriolis air sampler. Basically a Dyson, isn't it? Yeah, it is. <laughs> yeah, it, it is. It's if you think of a Dyson cyclone, yeah. it's basically the same principle as that. So the air comes in and it as it speeds up, it's, well, it, it circles around the, the cyclone. And that spinning air pushes on some liquid that's at the bottom. So the liquid starts to spin and it gets pushed against the walls of the cone-shaped flask. And just like a Dyson, it acts like a centrifuge. So anything heavier than air, so all the bioaerosols, are flung out to the sides where they merge with the liquid. So you run the machine for a while until you've got loads of these particles swimming around in the liquid. You take that liquid and you try and sequence the DNA that's inside it. Here's Rob Ferguson, a postdoc at the University of Essex. 
So we essentially, we just collect all the bacteria from the air and the fungi and we mash them up and we release the DNA and then we use that DNA to identify what is there and how much there is of it. This is where metagenomics comes in and metagenomics is amazing. Imagine this, you've got all these fragments of DNA, which I'm representing here as strips of paper with A's, T's, C's and G's written on them. In reality, these would be in a computer. And you notice that the end of one fragment of DNA matches the beginning of another fragment of DNA. And you suppose that these two fragments of DNA have come from two copies of the same organism and that one is just shifted slightly further along on the genome. So you take them together and now you have a much longer fragment of DNA. And then you notice that the end of that matches the beginning of another fragment of DNA. So you add that on and you keep going and your fragment of DNA grows and grows and grows until you have a whole gene. And so now you know that the gene for say antibiotic resistance is floating around in the air. So there must be organisms in the community that have that gene. And if you keep going, maybe you could sequence whole genomes. You could figure out the organisms that are generating these bioaerosols, or perhaps are these bioaerosols. In reality, it's not done with strips of paper. These fragments of DNA are stored in a computer, and it's not you doing the search for matches, it's the computer. I'm oversimplifying the process. <laughs> Like I say that a lot, but like one sense in which it's more complicated is that DNA loves to repeat itself. So you might find a match at the end of this fragment at the beginning of this fragment and you want to put them together. But actually the only reason they match is because that bit of DNA loves to copy itself. So it's all over the place and you get a false positive. And so like so many things in genetics, it becomes a game of statistics. Like you have millions of these fragments. So what you end up with is statistical confidence. Like I'm confident that this is a gene or a genome because I have multiple overlapping fragments that corroborate each other. So we've got these amazing machines, but where do we put them? We're interested in composting because it, it's almost the perfect source of, of bioaerosol emission. They receive a lot of waste organic material, so things like the clippings from the lawn. The stuff I put in the green bin. The stuff you put in the green bin, okay. exactly. And they chop it up into, into small pieces, pile it up into a big pile, which is called a windrow. You've made this big biological reactor and it's in the form of quite a dry material. And, the, and the, as you produce the compost, you have to agitate it. As you can imagine, under those conditions, it's easy for this material just to fly, fly away into the wind. Why worry about these additional emissions? Particulate matter in general, in elevated amounts, it's potentially a hazard to human health. There's a potential risk of infection. The second reason is that there are there are certain chemicals that can be emitted. These chemicals are component parts of the cells of some of the organisms that can cause inflammatory reactions. Here's an important question though. How do we know that these things cause harm? Like, do we test on humans? I mean, we do test things on humans, but it's better not to if we can avoid it. And one approach is to use what they call a, a cell model, which is basically where you take cells out of a body, usually a human body, but maybe some other animal, and you try to grow those cells outside of the body and then test on that. So in this case, you're taking lung cells, in particular macrophages and epithelial cells. The macrophage are looking out for trouble and when they see trouble, they, you know, they're waving a flag and then the epithelial cells are then responding to that. So there's a complicated array of chemicals that these cells produce when they're stressed. A quick aside, one of the ways we currently detect fragments of bacterial membrane, these endotoxins, is with the blood of horseshoe crabs, which happens to be blue. You collect a load of horseshoe crabs, you drain some of their blood, you release them back into the water, hopefully they stay alive. And you break open the blood cells and inside are these chemicals that react with endotoxins. They coagulate around the endotoxins and that's a result that you can easily observe. So that's why we use horseshoe crab blood for that purpose. So there you go. The farming of blue horseshoe crab blood is big business. Our vision is that our 
very expensive sensor could be converted through the data that we're collecting to be a really inexpensive one. You could have a ring of these sensors around your site um, to, that would take into account things like um, things like changing wind direction or at different distances from the site. So we could see, you know, the extent to which uh, any emissions can be seen at diff different distances. We're very interested in the fact that we can run these detectors all of the time, 24 seven. So if we found that in general, 90% of the day emissions are low, but there's this humongous peak associated with a particular activity. Process. We've certainly started to home in on the, the most important factors. There's the shredding of the source material. Mostly it's the turning of, of the compost heaps. So with these new techniques, we're already starting to see maybe things that we should change, but what would those changes look like? So th there could be changes in machinery that could, could be advocated. They could be doing it at certain times of the day or under certain wind conditions. There are ways of compost, doing outdoor composting that don't involve turning the waste. So things like uh, uh, forced aeration. You could even move the entire composting process indoors and install air filters and things like that. But obviously that's a hugely expensive thing to do and it will push up the price of compost. And similarly with the housing of animals, you can take steps to reduce bioaerosol emissions from the housing of livestock, but it costs money. So this isn't just a scientific challenge, it's kind of a political one as well. Like you have to ask the question, are you willing to pay more for your food so that people living near composting sites can have a better quality of life so that farmers are less likely to contract airborne diseases? And I suppose any good person would say, yeah, I'll, I'll pay more for my chicken nuggets. But it kind of doesn't work like that. You know, it's a, it's, it's a good example of an externality cost, which is a really interesting subject beyond the scope of this video. But, you know, how, how do you take an externality cost and, and bring it back into the machinery of capitalism? Yeah, it's a big subject. Um, you know, it's, it's about legislation, essentially. And is that something that we have the political will to do? Who knows? You might be wondering why there are two locations in this video. It's because I moved studio halfway through filming. So this is the new studio here. This isn't even the main shot that I'll be using in the new studio probably. I'll be doing like a wider shot that starts over there. I set this one up as a kind of like, hey, you know, let's talk. Let's, you know, sit down. And, and uh, I've got a wider lens as well. Um, so yeah, it's all going on. Uh, yeah, that's it. So that answers that question. Uh, this video is the third and final video in the series commissioned by the Eden Project with funding from the Natural Environment Research Council. The Natural Environment Research Council also funded Sean Tyrrell's research and Ian Colbeck's research. So there you go. That's it. Hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, don't forget to hit subscribe. Maybe think about supporting me on Patreon and I will see you next time. Wow.